Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you in worship this morning. Hey, let us uh, take a few moments to center ourselves for worship. Now I invite you to stand as you're able and we'll join together in the call to worship from Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayers from lips free of deceit. From you, let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the words of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. By your sword, deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals whose portion in life is in this world. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding your likeness. Now let us join together in singing hymn number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
Now let us join together in the prayer of confession. God of love, we confess with shame our tendency to give lip service to love while ignoring the situations that cry out for real expressions of that love. Forgive us our dishonesty to ourselves and to you. Activate our hearts with your truth so that empty claims of compassion will satisfy us no longer and our own ineffective love will burst forth in redemptive action through your grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Hear the good news, God's perfect love came to earth on Christmas. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Now I invite you to be seated and the Oligas will come up and light the Advent candle. We light this candle as a symbol of the love of Jesus Christ, which casts out all fear. May we prepare our hearts to receive this love with joy and to love one another as God has loved us. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Now let us prepare to join in hymn number 242, Love Came Down at Christmas. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we have received from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments, and we do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. 
All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. May we be blessed by the hearing and understanding of the word this morning. Pray with me. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we celebrate the fourth week of Advent, where we look for God's love. God's love is all around us in the beauty of nature in the love and friendships of our family and friends, and also, of course, in the love that God has for us and shared with us in sending Christ Jesus into the world. Jesus came to redeem the world and to save us from our sins and sometimes from ourselves. Dr. Paul Brand tells us about an interesting phenomenon that amputees often experience some sensation of a phantom limb. Somewhere locked in their brains, a memory lingers of the non-existent hand or leg. Invisible toes curl, imaginary hands grasp things. A leg feels so sturdy that a patient may try to stand on it. For a few, the experience includes pain. Doctors watch helplessly for the part of the body screaming for attention does not exist. One such patient was a medical school administrator, Mr. Barwick, who had a serious and painful circulation problem in his leg, but refused to allow the recommended amputation. As the pain grew worse, Barwick grew bitter. I hate it, he would mutter about the leg. At last, he relented and told the doctor, I can't stand it anymore. I'm through with that leg. Take it off. Surgery was scheduled immediately. Before the operation, however, Barwick asked the doctor, what do you do with the legs after they've been removed? We may take a biopsy and explore them a bit, but afterwards we incinerate them, the doctor replied. Barwick proceeded with a bizarre request. I would like you to preserve my leg in a pickling jar. I will install it on my mantel shelf, and then as I sit in my armchair, I will taunt that leg. Ha, you can't hurt me anymore. Ultimately, he got his wish, but the despised leg had the last laugh. Barwick suffered phantom limb pain of the worst degree. The wound healed, but he could not, he could feel the torturous leg, the swelling and the pressure as the muscles cramped, and he had no prospect for relief. He had hated that leg with such intensity that the pain had unaccountably lodged permanently in his brain. I believe that phantom leg pain provides a wonderful insight into the phenomena of false guilt. Christians can be obsessed by the memory of some sin committed or they believe that they have committed years ago. It never leaves them, crippling their ministry, their 
devotional life and their relationships with others. They live in fear that someone will discover their past and judge them for it. So they work overtime trying to prove to God that they are repentant and to others that they are good. But they end up erecting barriers against the enveloping love and grace of God. Unless they experience the truth of John 1, 3 through 19, that God God is greater than our hearts or the fears of our hearts, they become as pitiful as poor Mr. Barwick, shaking his fist in fury at the pickled leg on his mantle. Poor Mr. Barwick, more than just his leg was in a pickle. He had had such a love-hate relationship with his leg and the pain that it had caused him that he was not able to let go of that pain even after he had literally let go of the leg. Mr. Barwick did not want to lose his leg. He did not want to suffer that loss, and I understand it. It would mean the loss of some of his mobility and his ability to do some things for himself as easily as he used to do. But the pain became too great, and he finally relented and had the leg removed in order to relieve himself of that pain. But we hear in his desire for vengeance on that painful limb, his desire to be able to sit there and taunt the limb, which had caused him so much pain, that he'd internalized that pain and made it such a part of himself that it would not leave him, even after the troublesome leg itself had been removed. Now, most of us don't have such physically painful experiences in our past, but I bet some of us have some emotionally painful experiences from our past that may still be haunting us, kind of like Mr. Barwick's leg. Perhaps the pain of being judged that we are somehow not good enough at doing something or another. I remember that I was often the last child chosen to play baseball when I was young. Or perhaps we didn't measure up to someone's expectations maybe in our school grades or in our work performance. And we might have been told that we were stupid or lazy or whatever other label that someone wanted to hang on us in frustration for our perceived lack of performance or production. As a kid, I used to get average grades and that drove my dad up the wall. He would let me know in no uncertain terms of his disappointment in me for not working up to my potential. No doubt he did it out of love, hoping to inspire me to greater efforts in the future. But I'm afraid it had the opposite effect until I found something that really grabbed my interest and made me want to invest my time and effort. And I still need to fight against some of those internalized negative messages. Or maybe it's something we did either intentionally or unintentionally to someone in our past that we regret and have not been able to make amends for or to be forgiven for. Sometimes our feelings of guilt or shame over such an incident will have gotten internalized and continue to haunt us, just as Mr. Barwick's leg pain haunted him. It can be quite difficult to move past such things 
unless we get help in letting them go. These are examples of times when we may need to exercise self-love, situations where we need the willingness to forgive ourselves for whatever happened or didn't happen in the past and promise ourselves to be aware of such situations and to do better in the future. Let's face it, we're perfectly imperfect people who will never get things right 100% of the time. And we are generally our own strongest critics. I know that I am. We must remember that there is only one person in the world who has been perfect. And he came into the world to forgive us our imperfections. Most of the stories of Jesus are about love, healing, and forgiveness for people who were in need of it. He didn't condemn very much except for people in powers, positions of power who used their power selfishly and should have known better. Jesus had no tolerance for hypocrisy but he did have great compassion for the lost, the hurting, and the possessed. Jesus met people where they were and helped to meet their needs. He healed the blind, the deaf, the lame, and lepers. He forgave people of his, their sins, much to the chagrin of the establishment because Jesus knew how debilitating sin could be. Do you remember the story in Matthew where some people were carrying to him a paralyzed man lying on a stretcher? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, child, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Stand up, take up your bed, and go home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God who had given such authority to human beings. When the man's sins were forgiven, he was able to get up and leave, a fully restored human being. So I have to wonder if it was his mind or his body that caused the problems. That is the power of forgiveness. And sometimes the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. We are fallible human beings. We make mistakes. And if Jesus can forgive us, we need to be able to forgive ourselves. For that is sometimes the greatest love of all. Greatest love is the love and acceptance of self. We can't share what we do not have. And if we don't love ourselves, it's hard for us to love others. Perhaps because we are afraid that we may be beyond forgiveness and will be found out and condemned or possibly shunned. Remember also from Matthew, the greatest commandment. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For some of it, for some of us, I think that last part should maybe reversed. You shall love yourself as your neighbor. For it's often easier to love others than it is to love yourself. I sometimes have thought that loving others as I love myself would be shortchanging them. Now, I don't mean that you should aggrandize yourself and be all self-important and puffed up, but love yourself and accept yourself, flaws and all, just like God does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life, flaws and all. That is the first and greatest gift of Christmas, love for the whole world, including our neighbors and ourselves. Are we going to accept the gift or leave it sitting under the tree unopened? My prayer this Christmas is that we will each accept and open God's gift of love and forgiveness so that we can share it with others. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Thanks be to God for sharing the perfect gift of love with us. Let us accept it and then pass it on. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Now let us join together in the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we come into our time of prayer together. Does anyone have joys or concerns that they would lift up this morning? Okay, let us keep Vicki in our prayers as she will be undergoing surgery for her hand and is also suffering from cracked ribs. And also the, the joy that a friend sharing the, the Bibles that were dedicated to their parents and grandparents. Thank you for doing that and making sure that people have gotten them. Okay, for Olive's cousin Rebecca and her husband Tony, she had uh, a mastectomy and um, he is also suffering along with her. Okay, let us keep David's and Vicky's niece in our prayers. She delivered a, a new baby, but um, is suffering with the knowledge of her father's stage four pancreatic cancer. Okay, let us uh, remember just brother Gary, who is suffering from a, a rash in his joints. Let us keep in our prayers those who will be traveling for this Christmas week and weekend, share the uh, joy that Todd is progressing in his 
rehabilitation and is able to walk now um, with, the, with the parallel bars there to, to catch him if he needs it, but he is able to, uh, has worked up to over 20 feet without needing to, to rest, which is wonderful for someone who had been hospitalized and bedridden for over a year. Um, let us remember Sue, um, who is recovering from COVID in the nursing home. Uh, she is doing better. So that is a, a joy that uh, Brian shared with me. Let's also remember the, the West Chicago fire victims who have been displaced from their apartment units um, right before Christmas. And also all those who are, are working to help take care of their needs. And also those across the country who have been affected by the severe weather, the, uh, the blizzards across the northern parts of the country and the rain and tornadoes in the southern areas. And also those who will be affected by the um, cold snap that's um, going to be affecting us in the next few days. So let us take these joys and concerns that we have lifted up and those that yet remain upon our hearts to the one whose grace and strength are sufficient. Let us pray. Lord, you have heard the concerns and the joys that we have raised about our friends and our family and our neighbors. We pray that you will reach down and touch each of us at our points of deepest need and bless us according to your will. We give you thanks, Lord, for the, the love that came down at Christmas in the person of Christ Jesus, who would take on the sins of the world, forgive us of our sins, and then redeem us and the world so that your creation might be restored to the holy garden that it was meant to be. We pray for those around the world who find themselves in need, who have been displaced from their homes for whatever reason, who have lost their shelter, their possessions, perhaps friends and loved ones, and are unsure of where their next meal will come from or where they might stay. Lord, we give you thanks for those who work to meet the needs of your people. And we pray that you will open our hearts and minds and spirits to the workings of your spirit in the world, that we might act as your body to meet the needs of those who are hurting in this world, our brothers and sisters. Now we join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come into our time of the offering. We're continuing to collect for the Purple Band, which is missionary support for Larry and Jane Keyes, who are part of the missionary team in African University, teaching English and agriculture. If you would like to support their work, please make note of it with your um, gifts. Give thanks for all those who continue to mail, text, or bring in their offerings to support their 
the missions and ministries of Winfield Community United Methodist Church. Now let us join together in dedicating our gifts. Actions are what you look for, Lord of the Church. So let these words and these offerings signify what we will do to love and serve you. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you're able and join together in singing hymn number 170, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Take the love of Jesus and share it with a hurting world. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>